Hello, my friends, and welcome to the 43rd episode of Patterson in Pursuit. Got a change of pace for you today. Instead of talking strict philosophy or something about politics or economics, I'm going to talk about history and culture, specifically some of the history of the indigenous Maori in New Zealand, where I'm currently located. In the States, we have this very elementary idea that all indigenous people across the globe are all the same, and they're all Pocahontas. But obviously, this is a very crude way of thinking about the world and thinking about history. And New Zealand in particular has a really interesting and long indigenous history, where the first European settlers came as late as the 19th century. So joining me this week is Dr. Herini Ka, who teaches history at the University of Auckland. And he specializes in religious and cultural history, and especially how the Maori worldview changed when met with Christendom. So about half this interview, we're talking about actual indigenous beliefs about spirituality and about their religion. And then we talk about the changing from the original indigenous beliefs after contact was made in the 19th century. And the last part of our conversation is talking about the impact of colonialism on the Maori way of life and on their belief system. So it's a really fascinating conversation. I'm sure you guys will enjoy it. Before we start, I wanted to give some shout outs and some good news. Um, if you guys were following the excitement a couple of weeks ago when I started that Indiegogo campaign, I'm happy to say that after only a couple of days, we raised $1,000. And Jason Brennan right now, I believe, is in the process of reading and reviewing Square One. So that's pretty exciting. But also, I have been talking with the sponsor of the show, Praxis, and I got a cool deal for you guys. So if you guys have been hearing me rave about Praxis, it's because I deeply believe in their mission and their execution in taking young people who want a taste of the real world that either they're not getting or they know they won't get in academia. The company's been around for a few years, and they take people, place them straight into paid apprenticeships and get them actual training. And what's great is that they've hooked up listeners of this show. So occasionally I'll get an email from somebody or a Facebook message, somebody saying, hey, you know, I'm interested in Praxis. Could you tell me more? You know, I heard you talk about it on the podcast. But now you don't have to take my word for it. You can listen to a free module from their boot camp curriculum. It's called The Value Creation Mindset. And you can get it for free by going to steve-patterson.com slash Praxis. That's P-R-A-X-I-S. That'll take you to their page where you sign up with your name and email. And you can listen to the kind of training and prepping for that entrepreneurial mindset that you get in the Praxis program. So go check it out, steve-patterson.com slash Praxis. You won't be disappointed. All right, so back to learning about the history, the culture, the religious beliefs, the worldview of the Maori of New Zealand. So thank you very much, Dr. Ka, for sitting down and talking with me today. I have a lot of very elementary questions for you. There's a lot in the West, and especially in the States, people's knowledge of anything other than standard like Western philosophy, Western theology is very, very poor. Sure. So I wanted to talk to you about maybe some misconceptions and basic concepts in the Maori worldview. Right. So I guess the first question is, I'm sure you probably hear this all the time, and I imagine your eyes roll when you hear it, but there's a, there's a thought that in more indigenous cultures, they aren't big on the theology or the theism or the re formal religion, the orthodoxy. They're more spiritual. It's, it's spirituality. That's the term that gets thrown around, at least in the States. And that's, that's the trope word, spirituality. Is there any truth to the idea that in that Maori indigenous culture, there is some, you could call it, you know, religious beliefs, spiritual beliefs, but it doesn't come with a lot of the theological baggage? Uh, this is going to be annoying, but yes and no, of course. <laughs> um, I think in some ways, uh, partly this is a kind of a conflation of um, Western perceptions of indigenous spirituality. You know, so we might get lumped in with um, the Moana Disney cartoon and Native Americans exactly. and 
And so, um, particularly, I think, you know, come from an American perspective, um, Native Americans, you know, and this, this kind of crafted um, perception of them being free and, and unencumbered and, you know, the, the ultimate hippies who can just, you know, live with the spirit and with nature. Um, and, of course, so we get tied into that too. It's a kind of a yearning in some um, quarters, I suppose, in the Western world for some kind of spirituality, but one that comes without the dogma, without the, the baggage perhaps of Western mm-hmm. um, Christianity in particular, but other forms as well. Uh, so why that is not correct, perhaps, um, for Māori traditionally, um, religion, and that's a, you know, that's a big word with lots of meanings, but religion was uh, everything. Uh, we didn't have the dichotomy of the mundane and the sacred. Um, our leadership were, were also the embodiment um, of um, spiritual and secular power. Um, every rock, every tree, every um, river had modi, a life force, uh, tapu, sacredness was everywhere. Um, you took one wrong move and um, the consequences could be immense. Hmm. We came, in fact, from, um, it would make um, the most puritanical system look the most liberal nowadays because every aspect of life. You know, there wasn't just some God sitting in heaven waiting to judge us. Mm -hmm. Um, We were constantly um, surrounded by our gods. So, um, you know, in its traditional form, in its pre-contact form, um, yeah, I think our religion was, you know, maybe strictness, maybe that sense of control. Certainly that sense of order was present. Mm-hmm. Um, social hierarchy, social control, food. Um, who cooked food was tied um, intensely to um, our religious understanding, for example. So, you know, every aspect of life. So, yeah, this idea of us being free and going with the spirit, mm-hmm. just, you know. The uh, kind of Pocahontas type oh, idea. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, that, you know, um, certainly... Um, <laughs> didn't apply, I suppose. <laughs> uh, yeah, and we had uh, a very structured understanding, um, understandings, um, based on different tribes, based on different um, parts of the country, based on landscape. Um, but yeah, we had a very strong, rigid system, I suppose. So yeah. So can I ask you a couple questions sure, on that sure. on that topic? So you say it's structured. Yeah. Does the structure come from an internal set of beliefs about the sacredness of everything, or is the structure from what we might call the church, or something like the structure comes from the holy leaders, the spiritual leaders? Is it imposed from the outside, or is it something that is imposed from the inside? Yeah, I think imposed from the inside um, on balance, because um, we did have our experts, we did have our hierarchy who or repositories of knowledge who would provide guidance and law, keepers of law. Um, but having said that, every individual knew their place within this worldview, within this system. Um, everyone knew um, broadly the meanings of um, the system and how it operated. So yeah, I think um, it wasn't necessarily imposed externally. Again, this is pre-contact, you know, mm-hmm. with, with Christianity these things have changed um, to some degrees. But, yeah, I, I think from within um, to a large extent, but certainly with a, a kind of system of social control, which is, you know, is, the, is the church, I suppose. So what would be the um, origin, the explanation for those original beliefs, the pre-contact beliefs? Is there So in you know Christianity and in, in Judaism you have... Uh, Moses was on high, you know, received words from God. Is there a similar type of story, or is this more of like an emergent set of beliefs that that came from interacting with the world? Well, of course, you know, the Moses story is uh, a set of beliefs from interacting with the world they got turned into uh, Moses, (laughs) you know, so it's very hard to to, to make that uh, clear delineation. Uh, Ours comes from tens of thousands of years of peoples traveling across the Pacific. So the latest research is we come from um, China, um, southeastern China. Um, there are parts, and then we traveled across the Melanesia, across Polynesia, and ended up here. 
Um, there are parts of the Philippines, for example, where their traditional language, parts of Taiwan, parts of China where their language, their culture is um, very similar to yeah. ours. Their, their understandings of land, their la the word for land um, is almost identical. So, you know, um, it's experiential, right? It's, it was us traveling across the water, it's us going across those vast open seas in a small um, canoe with a reasonably basic sail um, and needing to be able to read the signs, the stars, the winds, the currents, the birds. And, you know, finding theology in that, um, just as um, uh, the Old Testament tribes, you know, found their meaning walking through on their journeys. Um, and their mountains had meaning, and our mountains have meaning. And mm -hmm. So, yep, so we found it. But we do um, tend to have our Moses characters through our ancestors. Mm. So um, we are, um, I suppose you could describe it as a, an ancestor um, worshipping um, people, our ancestors provide the uh, model for us, provided the the template, the behaviour, the language. Um, Maui, the demigod, who um, the rock plays um, in the Moana cartoon, for example, um, is a very common ancestor deity um, across. And again, you know, not not going to that Greek um, kind of idea where we're separating them. They were both our ancestor and our deity. Um, Maui, and then a range of ancestors, so I'm descended directly from Maui, for example, um, through a range of ancestors, through tribal ancestors. Um, they, their behaviours, their stories, their patterns uh, help to shape our understandings, our spirituality, um, give us our guide. So, in terms of how we might rationally understand some of those beliefs, when you say, you know, there was some spirit in everything, every single rock. Can you unpack that for me and what exactly that means if, so what for example would be like an essential distinction between the force that's in a rock and that which is in a human being? Right. If any. Yeah, yeah, if, if any because, uh, you know, to some extent, again, uh, it can be hard to, to quantify. I think we have different perhaps, typologies, but, so Modi, Modi is a word that refers to life force or essence, um, so every living, uh, and um, rock, stones, some things that aren't um, scientifically living, uh, can have Modi, can have this life force, this essence, um, this can be affected by human behaviour, this can be changed by, say, um, ancestor practices um, can uh, elevate some mountains, for example, some places because of the behavior, because of the actions of the ancestors in these places. So it can change their, their um, spiritual nature for us. But um, generally speaking, the idea that um, there is this um, life force that flows through um, all of creation that was um, part of creation, um, that the gods um, in our creation stories um, imbued this life force and it exists within all of us and we're part of it, connected. The big, I suppose, concept for us is Māori, is whakapapa, is connections. So in some ways it's genealogy, so it's those connections um, vertically back to our ancestors. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's also horizontal, so um, it's going back to, say, the god of the forests. This is, you know, some simplistic, I suppose, or a simple um, explanation. And then trees. So Tani Mahuta, the giant tree up in the far north, for example, um, is in some ways um, both connected to me as a relation, as an ancestor, through the god of the forests. So the sense of connection that everything can be connected. Um, this was challenged a lot by the arrival of um, uh, the first settlers, explorers, but but the idea of whakapapa, of connection. Um, there's no um, us and them. Uh, we can fight, we don't have to uh, love all these other components, um, but we are connected to them and we recognise that connection. So there would be, so you said there's no us and them, so, does that just apply to humans and different humans, or is it 
Is it literally that as I'm conceiving of myself, my own being, my own modi, that it is identical to the one in what we would consider inanimate objects? Or is there any, is there any special uniqueness given to the human? Right. Um, okay, so are, are humans uh, exceptional within this, this creation? Um, generally, it, 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 again, it depends. So some, some places, some spaces. Again, it's a tricky kind of concept because, um, again, I'm trying to kind of think through Western, you know, almost comparative values, and then we're trying to. I'm trying to think back into how we might conceive of it, and that's that's challenging. Partly because you know, um, a humans in competition with rocks. Well, no, because you know, it was a matter of coexisting with rocks and with the trees and with the, you know, we were living amongst them. Um, so you know, it wasn't necessarily that humans are greater or had more worth. So, you know, the ultimate extension of that question might be, um, do we save the tree or do we save the baby? Sure. But, um, you know, the tr in, in that pre-contact culture, uh, you, would, you had to exist with the tree because it was a matter of survival. You know, the, the kind of economic, environmental exploitation that we have now. Um, you know, that's a new phenomenon. Making those choices between the environment and humanity is, you know, how long has that been around? A um, few hundred years maybe, you know, maybe a couple of thousand, but um, people, you know, didn't have to make those kind of choices. I, you know, and I'm trying to think of, um, we don't have, for example, um, large animals, so we don't have to um, hmm. kind of do that kind of comparison either, you know, so... Um, the environment was largely beneficial. Um, and when it was dangerous, say for example, um, the sea in particular, um, we would relate that to our behavior. Almost a type of, our relationship with the environment was also tied to a form of, say, sin. So um, if you transgressed against this modi, this tapu, this sacredness, against the gods, then you could suffer, whether that's sickness, danger, um, physical danger. Um, that was breaking those particular laws around the relationship with the environment. Um, but yeah, I think largely um, we wouldn't have to... I'm struggling to think about that balance between the environment and humanity because we didn't have to make those choices, perhaps. Yeah. So let me ask you one more question on the kind of pre-contact sure, ideas sure. and then we'll talk about sure. what, what has changed. In my own pursuit of truth in a bunch of areas, I'm interested in religion because I think there's something, I have a very much bias toward like Western philosophy. That's my, my orientation. But I find that the experience of love has really forced me to expand my worldview. Um, and I'm persuaded by some of the ideas in Christianity and some ideas in uh, love is something that's talked about in almost every religion. What would the traditional Maori conception of love be? Is it mm. something that is a gift? Is it something that is another another range of experiences? Is there anything any categorical uniqueness given to that? Mm. Well, you know, and again, we're we're polluted by the um, kind of genius reconception of love with Christianity, for example. So you know. It's, that self-sacrificing love that, um, you know, that, well, of course that was us, <laughs> but of course it wasn't. <laughs> um, yeah, the idea, for example, of um, manakitanga is a concept that means a range of things, generosity, hospitality, um, whakapapa of connection. Uh, I think the idea when you are connected to one another, um, that's an unbreakable connection, effectively. Um, that goes for generations back. That goes for gen that you know will go for generations forward. Um, the you know the the idea of no one is really a stranger because you know you're connected to everybody and to everything. Um, having said that, we're as capable of exploitation as any other culture of domination, of greed, of creating fear. We ate one another. Um, you know, which is kind of the ultimate um, 
form of um, diminution of your opponent. You know, we, we ate one another, not for protein, but to um, minimize the, the mana, the authority, the integrity, the um, leadership perhaps of your enemy. You know, so we really knew how to um, take it. So you know, we knew how to act without love as well. Mm-hmm. You know, we weren't the free flowing, love everybody. Having said that, if it was your own uh, people and you had, or an, uh, uh, we would have divisions, political divisions perhaps, um, economic divisions um, with our enemies, but within your own family group, whether in your own unit, um, your relationship was absolute. You would um, sacrifice for one another. You would, um, you really, the idea that you conceive of an individual loving an individual, well, you know, what is an individual? Um, when you're not really thinking along those lines. Um, I just want to be me. Well, that wasn't really a very common thought, I mean, you know, because because of the way we lived, you know, because we were living um, very different from today. I suppose, I know I'm not really answering the question, but I, I would say love, perhaps in the way we conceive it today, uh, you know, not on the romantic sense, but um, in that sense of um, willing to lay down your life for another, perhaps, um, we certainly had that conception, um, and it was built into our culture. But we also had the opposite of love. We were just as capable of anyone else of that as well. So when you're talking there about the conception or lack of conception of self, I think that's what a lot of people romanticize. They love that idea. Uh, they love that idea of it's not self-sacrifice. It's almost like um, self-diminution. That there's that at the elevation of the community, the community um, giving to the community, not even conceiving yourself as something separate from the community. That's something that's very hard for me to wrap my head around because my experience is so extremely focused from my perspective, from the self perspective. So in that mindset, do you think that like in, in daily life, there was a substantial difference in the conscious experience of the Maori who's not conceiving necessarily of himself as rigidly as we are. And do you think that that was like a different way of, literally a different way of experiencing life when you see yourself as connected to part of a group or a community? Mm. Yeah, again, it's, it's tricky because your individual um, status, your your individual sacredness, your individual authority, integrity, um, was could could kind of go up and down depending on your behaviour, depending on your relationships with one another. So so you know, we did conceive ourselves but having said that, um, you know, your goals were effectively, you know, not subsumed, but, you know, came from others. Um, you, you sense that your ancestor deities are constantly around you, um, you know, with you. Um, you know, you're not just an individual. Every behaviour, um, it's not what you get away with in private because there is no private because your ancestor deities are always there with you for starters. So, you know, that, that sense of, um, uh, yes, you were responsible for your own actions. Yes, you... Um, could even advance your yourself, but um, very different to the way we do today. Um, and certainly your um, kin group behavior, your kin group well-being um, was really the measure of your well-being. Hmm. Um, if it went up, you went up. If it went down, you went down. And your behavior would reflect on them as well. Um, so you couldn't break away from them. You, you wouldn't even conceive of doing that. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, it's tricky. Uh, yeah, yeah. Again, it's that sense of um, wow. That, that's you know, again the ultimate hippie, um, the ultimate commune. But right. but you know that that's that's seeking freedom from a system that didn't exist. So you know, you can't even conceptualise of it at mm-hmm. the time. Um, and and I think our our interaction with. Um, Western ideas, Western technologies was quite instructive. You know, how we responded, particularly early on, um, kind of helps kind of test what was actually going on before contact, you know. Mm-hmm. So so individualism did wear its head occasionally, but again, it was 
pretty rare and quite different. Um, you know, even using Western tools, even today. You know, I'm very Western. I'm wearing all my clothes are made by Bangladeshi exploited laborers, I'm sure. And, you know, I'm just part of this global, you know, economic and exploitative community of the West. But um, I still consider my kin group, um, my purpose of life, um, my measure of life, of well-being, um, my own goals um, need to factor into these. So, you know, still um, 200, you know, maybe 250 years later, we're still um, living that kind of system um, in a lot of ways. That's an excellent segue to talking about that 250 years ago. So maybe just a little bit of the history of you know, when the settlers came, that initial, that initial interaction, the exchange of cultural information, economic information, contact between two radically different civilizations, how that happened, when it happened, and maybe some of the worldview changes that followed from that, because a big part of this is Christianity. So how the initial, you know, it, was it the case that there was... Uh, missionaries that that came and spoke to the Maori and all of that so can we start let's start with that that initial contact and then we'll kind of work from there sure sure um, so one one thing to you know kind of um, introduce that is that we are a very tribal people I talk about kin group and um, we are Māori that's our collective name but we didn't call ourselves that you know because we didn't need a collective name of course um, Māori just essentially means normal um, you know we're the normal Everyone else is strange. <laughs> um, so by tribal kin groups, um, experiences were quite different. That, that's just something to kind of remember. Um, you know, there's no one indigenous mm. experience. There's mm -hmm. no money. So. And so I kind of speak from my own tribal experience um, as well, um, which is, again, quite different from some others. But the original co initial contact, um, you know, you get the early explorers, Tasman, James Cook, and um, those are really... Um, even though some of them were quite fleeting, they were integrated into a lot of tribal um, oral histories, oral, because they were so profound. Um, you know, we were connected to everything until this new thing came sailing around the corner. Suddenly our worldview, which was connection, struggled. You know, well, what, what are these things? Mm -hmm. um, you know, some attempts were made to reconcile them, but they were just so different. Um, that was, you know, an immediate challenge. Uh, it'll be when the aliens arrive here, you know, how, how are we going to respond? I, I right. think one's already in the White House today, but I think... <laughs> Not today, tomorrow. Yeah, oh, oh, right, right. oh, thank God for the deadline. But um, the, um, you know, how are we going to respond? Just that, that complete, in some ways, um, need to grapple. As I said, though, we... we um, no culture is static. We um, weren't, you know, <laughs> created then locked in stone. We um, sailed across the, you know, vast oceans, across tens of thousands of years to get here. So we've been constantly evolving and adapting. Um, when we got here, we ate all the moa, for example, all the giant flightless birds. We ate all the low hanging fruit. Um, we had to pretty much repitch our our civilization after that. Hmm. So we'd, we'd been through this process. A lot of our iwi, a lot of our tribes have these kind of stories of, of cultural, massive cultural shift built into them um, to deal with change, mm -hmm. um, whether it's climate change, which is part of our story, you know, on the, on the small scale. So, um, you know, while it was earth shattering, we were capable of change as well. We were adaptive. We were um, innovative. Um, as much as any people need to be, you know, humans are humans. We're just good at survival as well. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we didn't just sit there and go, oh, let's give up then. Um, and so, and also, uh, a lot of the aspects of this other culture, um, while, while radically different in a lot of respects, also brought a lot of similarities. But uh, <laughs> often in ways they didn't quite understand. So the missionaries, you know, the the classic, um, what are they? Uh, missionaries are like dirt. They're impossible to miss and just, you know, they're just the easy targets for 
Um, missionaries were the first the first permanent settlement in this country. It was 1814. It was a missionary settlement and um, came over from Australia. There had been a long history though of Māori travelling to Australia and to England and around the world to America. Before that, as soon as we could, we raced out around the world. Um, find what it was some horrible experiences, some amazing experiences. Um, but so technology was huge. Um, the arrival of um, you know, metal. We were a stone culture. Your you know, metal was huge. Weapons, of course, were fantastic for people who like to fight. Um, but the biggest change, of course, was ideas. You know, um, economic ideas alone were radical. The idea that um, you could sell things, you know, that permanently. Um, we had a, an economic system based on exchange. Um, reciprocity effectively there was a, a you know commercial in some respects but um, it was also spiritual effectively again we didn't separate so you, you went into a commercial transaction um, there was a form of mana of, of, of spiritual interaction in that as well so you know the idea that you could do cold hard cash exchange wow well, that's, that's something for starters Christianity though um was kind of brilliant because at its heart Christianity was um, the Jewish culture and story and uh, a people who had their God the intimate God traveling with them you know in the in the in the first testament but of course you know <laughs> the New Testament's just the first testament you know um, um, you know it's coming from the first testament there's, there's, you know those ancestor stories are coming to life again and in in Jesus, so um, and being retold by this new rabbi, so um, those relationships with their gods, those relationships with the land, those relationships with their sacred mountains. Wow, hey, what's the problem? We, we got all that. We get that. Of course, we get that. We don't know what the hell these missionaries talking about. We'll just ignore their their stuff. You know, like here, yeah, you guys are just reading it all wrong. Thanks. We this was actually pretty common around the country. Um, because of literacy, right, was a huge technology that, that incorporated both technological change and idea change. Literacy was a transmission of ideas, so it was amazing. We, we had our own literacy, we had this amazing oral tradition, we had carvings, we had the landscape, but, you know, literacy took it up a whole level, mm -hmm. as it did for, you know, Europe um, in the, you know, 15th, 16th century. So, um, and of course, the first literacy was um, with these stories, where the Gospels was um, these um, stories from these other iwi across the world, but we could really relate to them. Hmm. They disseminated. The scale was spectacular. Tens of thousands of Bibles of Anglican prayer books being disseminated around the country. Literacy rates were spectacular. A people who lived in the spiritual landscape didn't require much prompting to embrace you know the spirituality of um, those who arrived here um, and and adapt it um, and rethink it we had our own theologians they take a look at these writings are like okay okay we we'll think our way through this um there are like you know 12 missionaries they're not like now you people, here's what you got to do. They were living in fear up in the north, watching us eat one another. They weren't going to like, they didn't even get around the country much to start off with. The process of the transmission of Christianity was Māori driven. Hmm. Um, the process of interpretation was Māori driven. Um, you know, so you've got in the um, kind of 1840s, late 1830s, you've got a dozen, you know, missionary, part white missionaries. You've got 400 Māori evangelists around the country mm. who'd, who'd learnt basic literacy, who'd learnt the scripture from these missionaries and from one another, then took off around, back to their own people mm. and shared this message. So the transmission, it, it's not what we think. You know, It wasn't missionaries telling everyone what to do. Right. Um, it was that engagement of ideas, that interpretation of ideas amongst Māori, by Māori. My own tribal story explicitly rejects um, white missionary involvement, um, almost, um, almost <laughs> to the point of, yeah, okay. I don't think it was quite that um, extensive, but um, you know, because the point was we made our own choices around mm -hmm. it, and and we reconciled um, our 
pre-contact culture with Christianity on our own terms. So we decided that um, the practice of eating one another um, was not a good practice. You know, it's quite rational thinking. It's like, but we needed this, these new ideas to kind of make that breakthrough. Um, the idea of endless reciprocity um, that turned into endless warfare. So your ancestor ate my ancestor. We're gonna we're gonna live this out forever. Mm. And because of our amazing old traditions, we're never gonna forget it. Mm-hmm. Uh, the idea of Christian forgiveness could break that cycle. Mm. But we would apply it, thanks. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, those kind of ideas. Mm-hmm. So it was um, a spectacular um, intellectual um, development by the various tribes in different ways at different times um, that had different results, um, but still spectacular nonetheless. And... Um, Often, I think the irony was the the missionaries who brought the ideas didn't quite always understand the ideas. They brought their own, you know, the first missionary Marsden, um, he equated Christianity to civilization. We would only be truly converted when we acted, spoke, thought like he did. Hmm. Um, you know, whereas Marty was saying, well, no, no thanks, of course. <laughs> understand our own just And, uh, you know, later on, of course, the missionaries were... Like the CMS who sent them there, they had some great thinking around culture and gospel, but later on um, that faded. But it wasn't a radical thought that indigenous cultures could coexist alongside right. um, the gospel. So, yeah, so this kind of simplistic story of missionaries and of the arrival of Christianity um, um, isn't always what it's made out to be. So, could you put it this way that the stereotypical story is that it was missionaries arriving and hitting everybody on the head saying believe this way or else and it was Christianity as kind of a a set of dogma dogmatic beliefs what actually was the case is the ideas of Christianity the Maori people found many of them persuasive doesn't really matter what the the transmission that it's the white missionary saying this and then there was a natural dissemination of those ideas they found superior. Absolutely. And I think as you talked about before, the central idea of love, for example, very powerful, you know, as we've seen in, you know, uh, throughout history, um, transformative, um, transcendent, um, enabled us. Now this is a slightly um, radical, even subversive idea. Um, and in the context of colonization, See, we haven't yet kind of talked about colonization, about all the bad side. So it's tricky saying this, but Christian love, in some respects, enabled us to fulfill our beautiful culture. So, you know, they traveled across these beautiful ideas of of fun, of family, of, of our relationship, of interconnection. Christian love could really, oh, God, right. That, that's the, almost like the ingredient we were missing. And mm-hmm. this is not missionary ideas of love. This is the central gospel tenet, which, you know, the disciples struggled with. Uh, the lawyer asked Jesus, you know, and Jesus, the, so even the people around Jesus weren't getting it. So it's not like it's, you know, everyone knew the secret and we were received it. It was, it was a particular revelation, you know, and, uh, and an intellectual revelation that um, enabled us to fulfill the full potential of our culture. Um, Because until then, you know, that that endless warfare, look, we were 90% of the time, 95% of the time, we were fishing and growing kumara, sweet potato, and, you know, getting on with life, and we had fun, and we had relationships, and we had, you know, but, but yeah, we also had this um, side to our culture that was essentially vengeance was was dominant and it enabled us to remove that there are it's complicated there are other sides there's english you know pax britannia english law there's mm-hmm. a whole bunch of other things that also um enforce the type of peace on us um poverty enforced type of peace on us we, we have the luxury of warfare but um a lot of our old traditions our old histories do point to this ability to transform and, and, and again, we'd had these reconciliation um, practices, understandings, but, you know, this just kind of, oh, okay, this will, like, power it up. This will take mm-hmm. it to the place we kind of wanted to go to. Mm-hmm. Um, like, every 
every society wants peace, don't they? You know, so how do we find that? Well, um, but then came colonization. So. Yes. so one more question about the ideas, and then I think I, we, let's talk about colonization. So would you say that the storyline isn't the Maori beliefs versus the Christian beliefs? And maybe there's you know, tension between the two and oh, this, this um, difficult struggle and fight. It's really Maori beliefs that were informed by a set of other beliefs that there's no, there's not really, especially when we're talking about Christian love, it seems like that's not going to cause more tension, that that can be incorporated into that existing belief system without any tension. Do you think that's fair? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, and, and Christian love that was also wrapped with, you know, I mean, Christian love's present throughout the First Testament. It's just, you know, people kind of look past it to all the fun stories. And, um, you know, Jesus didn't just pluck this out of thin air, right? He's, he's distilling their story. He's finding the best of their culture. He's finding, you know, the tensions in the Sabbath, and he's finding the tensions in the law, and he's saying, look, we've got to think about this. Well, same applied to us. Every culture needs to critique itself. It's when it's critiqued externally, that's the problem. When the missionaries say you're not worthy, well, that can get stuffed. But us critiquing ourselves, well, that's a powerful. And finally, um, we had this amazing new tool with mm -hmm. which to critique intellectually. We'd been spending all our time, um, you know, thinking deep thoughts. Um, we had this expertise. We could test it. It was amazing. But again, you know, the Jewish story particularly had worked for us because, you know, the ancestors, the land, the mountains, it, we could, it wasn't all alien. You know, we could kind of see where it was coming from mm -hmm. and we could reconcile on a whole bunch of levels with these stories. In fact, we could incorporate them into our stories. Um, you know, into our ancestors to some degree. I've I got to say, I mean, we might go there a bit later, but um, this this is controversial, I suppose, some of this, um, my thinking, um, because at the moment we're going through, we've been going through for a while, a, a cultural renaissance, you know, the kind of post-colonial. It's tricky too. Um, in which we're recovering traditional knowledge, you know, recovering if essentially a lot of suppressed knowledge. Um, our language was almost just decimated. It, it, it's tricky to say that we self critiqued in in a um, in the midst of this kind of revival renewal, because that implies we weren't perfect. Um, so it's it's a little bit controversial, you know. Part of this uh, renaissance for Māori is predicated on the idea that we were perfect and mm -hmm. the only problem was the arrival of, you know, colonisation. The idea that maybe we weren't quite perfect and, you know, some of it was, but then, you know, because of course that gets misused by a lot of people, by a lot of um, dynamics. So, so I just wanted to kind of, you know, it, it's tricky thinking in some respects and which is of course why Christianity is so unpopular because it, it's tied to colonisation as mm -hmm. well. So that idea of Christian love was great but you know it's everything else that came with it the exactly. bags that came in that was a problem exactly well let's talk about it so well, that's the, the talking about the ideas the christian love is beautiful people incorporate them in practice that also came like you said with colonization with uh, political structure imposed with economic structure imposed so that also those impositions and those tensions also have an effect on the culture itself the cultural dynamics between, you know, traditional and the foreigners who are imposing their structure on you. So can you talk a little bit about that, um, what the difficulties are, what, with the, what the tensions were, maybe what some of the, you know, um, justified anger was and is towards that particular system? Sure. Well, you know, colonization at its heart is, was, was and is. <laughs> economic exploitation, you know, let, let's go over there and, you know, strip strip mine that place. Um, you know, race comes into it, ideas of superiority. So it's not a good experience for those being colonized, you know, because it's predicated on you losing everything, mm -hmm. um, you losing everything valuable. We were a culture based on land, you know, the, these various aspects of land. Um, colonization here in in this country was based on um, the acquisition of land. 
um, which we, we're going to lose out on, um, inevitably, and because of our technological and um, you know, demographic um, disadvantage. So, um, and, and Christianity was used by um, colonization deliberately um, as a form of control. Um, you know, different ways around the world. So in, in North America, you get the mission schools, um, which is a very terrible exploitative. Um, you know, in South America, you get, well, that, that's a whole other story. Here you get um, Christianity um, being used to make Māori conform as a, as a mm. form of control. The early missionaries were, were you know, they had their challenges, um, but they were um, evangelical. They had, you know, let, let's say I wouldn't necessarily question their, um, their heart was mostly in the right place. Their mind wasn't always quite in the right place, but later on, but very quickly, um, by the 1860s, particularly with the military um, conquest of Māori, and by 1872 really it was over, um, the Christianity quickly turned into um, a vehicle for helping to enforce colonisation. So the church turned itself away from Māori. Um, Māori leadership got co-opted into Christianity as a, again another form of control or assimilation. Um, ideas of um, compliance, uh, you know, the British Empire, um, the Anglican Church was the, the flag bearer for the British Empire. It saw its role, it saw the British Empire as basically a gift from God, that its role was to support and uphold. It didn't ever really question the basis of this. And um, and some of the enlight more enlightened theology, some of the brilliant theology, the Treaty of Waitangi, which was the, really the compact signed between um, the British Crown and Māori leadership uh, in 1840, um, was predicated largely, a, a large underpinning of that was um, evangelical theology. So the Clapham sect that abolished slavery um, had a huge input into that treaty. It was an amazing document. Hmm. But that all wore away pretty quickly in the huge wave of that economic exploitation. Um, ideas of racial superiority, you know, which don't come up until kind of later in the, in the kind of modern form, later 19th century, but um, it was just... Um, a huge wave, um, and Māori culture was just not really going to survive that um, intake. You know, the dismissal of any worth of our ideas, of our relationship with the land. Um, it was left entirely up to us to try and save what we could. Um, our language was um, the schooling system. You know, formally banned effectively. Um, our language, you know, every every aspect of society was made to drive our culture, um, to eradicate our culture. If not us, you know, often it was us. Um, there were episodes of um, genocide around the country in different parts of the country where Māori were killed, um, you know, on the spot. Um, so yeah, this is this is the history that goes alongside, um, you know, the idea of love. This is why it's so problematic um, to talk about Christianity and its, and its benefit for us um, because it's overwhelmed by this. Um, we went from um, having the being able to enjoy, because ownerships are complicated for us, um, able to enjoy 100% of this land. Um, now we own legally less than 5%. Um, you know, our population um, reached its absolute, we're all going to disappear by the end of the 20th century. Our language is still only spoken by 12% of Māori fluent in the Māori language, you know, and, and it's at risk of disappearing still. You know, all these are kind of measures, I suppose, of, I mean, you know, people hopefully shouldn't need much of an introduction to colonisation, but that's the experience here. In the middle of that, again, the Christianity represented by the churches um, was part and parcel of this experience, of this um, exploitation. Mm. So very hard for us to um, you know, consider it objectively. Now, when did things start to change from that kind of active persecution to a more tolerant atmosphere where you don't have you know, genocide going on? You, I think we've, we've just been visiting for about a month, but you can see that there's an active effort to try to have that acceptance and re-emergence of the traditional culture. When did things start to change? 
and again, just to be provocative, verging on facetious, maybe it hasn't. Just because uh, Māori are still by far the poorest people in this country, the poorest communities. We're by far the worst health, the lowest education, we die younger. You know, if it has turned around, it's hard to measure. Uh, you know, we, we're still... And, and it's not looking like it's going to get better. We're not relatively relative to other um, ethnic groups um, improving our position. Maybe some immigrants are going to do worse than us, but, you know, it's not much of a measure. Um, they're just being exploited more than we are. So, you know, that's one thing, right? It hasn't... Post-colonials, a tricky term because colonisation doesn't ever really end. It's just, we'll put the stars and stripes in the corner of our flag and see the Union Jack now, and maybe the Chinese flag later on, and you know, because um, that economic exploitation hasn't gone anywhere either. Okay, but um, there has been so a consistent resistance to colonisation. Um, it comes in very different forms, uh, but throughout, from that very early engagement, Māori have constantly um, said okay, we'll engage, but here is what we need from this relationship. Here's what's important to us. Here's what we're going to protect with our lives if necessary. Here's what, here's the core. Yep, I'll wear Bangladeshi um, exploited, you know, child-made clothes. Yep, I'll talk your language. Yep, I'll, but um, here's the core that I'm never going to surrender. That um, has been consistent. So language, for example, what land we could, um, Various aspects of culture have survived, um, adaptively, uh, including you know the ability for us to always be a, to adapt our culture on our own terms, as opposed to what we're told to do um, or made to do. That, that's a different process again. Um, so there's always been this resistance. There's always been um, military resistance, um, kind of ended in the 1870s, but you know it's been the, the kind of hang in there. Some people might say you know kind of early 20th century, there's still some military resistance. Um, political resistance has been ongoing. Um, petitions, um, the Treaty of Waitangi has always been upheld by Māori. And when Pākehā actually literally left it to be ignored by rats in a basement, Māori have held on to it as a sacred um, covenant, um, which was a language to which the Crown put forward. Um, there's always been this constant resistance. Pākehā haven't always even been aware of it, but it's always been there. We lived in our rural areas. Um, after World War II, um, Māori moved to the cities, um, very similar to Native American um, urbanisation. Um, economic reasons, government policy forced us into the cities. We left our country areas behind. Um, we got a new generation raised in a more radical, uh, you know, this kind of civil rights flowovers. The protest movements of the 60s in the States affected us here. The intellectual ch um, Ideas, you know, Franz Fanon and, um, you know, all the big thinkers kind of flowed through to us. The post-colonial uh, thinkers gave us a new language. Um, we had new leadership that could challenge um, white society um, directly. Um, we had new intellectuals who could think um, perhaps in a different way. Um, well, in a new way kind of often the same old thoughts, you know, the same traditional thoughts, but expressed in a new way. Um, but really, I think 1970s, 1960s, 70s, um, the white uh, society became aware of us again, more radical action, particularly we were living in the cities. Um, places within the academy, so the university um, became, you know, also um, either influenced or infected, depending on what side of the spectrum you're sitting on, by these ideas. And and the history departments were particularly um, um, places of um, for new ideas. I'm just, of course, uh, self-promoting there. But, but it really was. The idea of New Zealand history being retold um, to Pākehā, um, European um, people telling each other, actually, this is what happened in this land and we need to think about it. That led to some quite radical changes. You know, the, the Pākehā middle class came through these, this university in particular, these universities, were influenced by these ideas, particularly by these historians, which is a long, boringly patient um, work, um, went off and took up their middle class, um, you know, public service jobs in government. And um, when they got into positions of influence, they thought, actually, we can do something about that now. 
Um, so the treaty was brought back into the discussion. This came alongside um, the 1980s, alongside your um, sunny optimism of Ronald Reagan. We got our neoliberal um, revolution here. Um, that was quite radical in a lot of ways. Um, created a lot of poverty, particularly for Māori. Oh, the irony. Um, you know, through tens of thousands of Māori into, back into a kind of dire poverty. They've been lifted out of by our social welfare system. But um, the treaty got back on the table, tribes got empowered. Um, there are a lot of settlements of historical grievances through the Waitangi Tribunal that's happening right now. Um, tribes were given settlements of land, not much land, um, but money, um, resources. And now tribes are some of the biggest um, economic entities in this country. In Auckland City here, the land was taken. It's a terrible story, which which at its low point, um, Auckland City Council pumped raw sewage right on top of the Māori community down by the waterfront there. You know, there's no greater probably sign of how they were how they viewed Māori. Uh, and then burnt their village down because young Queen Elizabeth was visiting and it would be an eyesore. So burnt their village down and finally... They've been here for, you know, hundreds of years, since we arrived in this land and then... Anyway... Um, you know, and now they're the richest landowners in Auckland City. You know, because again, we had the courage, I think, as a country, to um, grapple with our story, with our history, with those ideas, um, to say Māori culture actually have, might have something to contribute. We've got a long way to go, um, but I think particularly. So some of that was political, some of it was legal. Oh, the lawyers, and you know, and the politicians and. Who, who think in relatively short you know, time spans sometimes. Um, the, work, the big work to be done is the intellectual challenge of how as a Western country we incorporate indigenous Māori thinking into our culture. Mm -hmm. You know, that applies particularly things like, say, climate change, um, our relationship with the environment, the kind of easy, low-hanging fruit. Um, but there's been some amazing work by the Waitangi Tribunal, for example, on intellectual property. They did a report on it. But it's far bigger than that. It's really about our collective values as a country um, and what some of the possibilities are. So, you know, there's, there's a lot of kind of behind-the-scenes work being done by intellectuals in, in unexpected places, driven often by lawyers. But that's all right. It'll still get somewhere. It'll still have some value um, beyond their pushing the money button every six minutes, um, that will um, really make a big change. But we're in the middle of that process. And meanwhile, Māori um, are really grappling with our identity. So we're in this revival. Um, we've got emergent schooling now, which you know started in the 1980s. Um, so, you know... Numbers are still not as high as they could be. Things are still at risk. But, you know, that brings through a generation. It's not just about language. It's about the ideas behind that language that these um, young people are fully um, versed in, those values, those ideas. Um, but they're different, you know, from the generations that preceded them. So it'll be really... Um, there's a type, of, also a type of fundamentalism in there. So gender roles, you know, um, what Māori men are supposed to look like is being redefined in a way I, f I find a bit problematic sometimes. Um, the warrior model is boringly um, trotted out um, when actually we were nurturers, you know, most of the time. So there's some challenges for Māori, but again, that's that critique. Christianity is being deliberately removed um, in some respects, like like it's being put through a filter and they're taking out everything Western. And, you know, mm. So... Love is kind of infused in there now. It's a bit too late, hopefully, to take it out because it's amazing. You'll get the deepest minds and they'll quote, they'll be quoting all this traditional knowledge. And in the middle of it, even without them knowing, they'll be quoting scripture, you know, <laughs> because it's become so infused. Yeah. Um, and some, often they do know, but sometimes, you know, you have a little giggle because it's like, um, yeah, the idea of love, for example, because, you know, assuming we're not going to eat each other again as part of our revival, and I'm pretty sure we're not. Um, but there are some challenges there, um, and I, I really worry if we, one, we're not allowing ourselves to have any agency in that adaptation. You know, the introduction of Christianity was colonisation, that's it. It's got to be removed. 
mm. is a lot more complicated than that. Right. So it kind of takes away the responsibility or the uh, the active yeah. intentional choices yeah. to incorporate those. Yeah, ideas. our agency. We now the young Aspro story, our tribal story is we chose to incorporate it, and we've actually got that story written down, but we've forgotten it somewhere along the way, and we ch and, or it's it's very unfashionable for us to remember that. So yeah, so you take love out, you got a dip, you got a problematic culture. So let me ask you one more question. It's been fascinating. As you've been talking about the history, you use we. Right. And I wonder, is this from your, and you've, you've talked about the oral traditions, is this from the research that you've done? Obviously, you're an academic, you've done a huge amount of writing, or is this from your experience of the oral tradition when you're talking about a lot of this history? Yeah. Or both? Yeah, yeah, uh, uh, both. Um, uh, <laughs> I, I, sorry, I've got a story. I finished my master's thesis here at this university um, on an aspect of our, our, actually it was about our Māori dairying schemes. We got cows and had our own milk factory. Sounds pretty boring for, for our tribe. And, um, but it was really our conscious decision to engage with the modern New Zealand economy. Uh, and in that engagement, we made a lot of really interesting choices. Anyway, it's very interesting if you're into that kind of thing. I, and I got a good mark, and it was all very, oh, wow. And I took it back to my family and my kin group, and the response was, oh, we already knew that. <laughs> and I was like, oh, oh, <laughs> oh, you're supposed to be praising me up, not telling. It was really, an, you know, I learned a lot in that when I, when, when I got over myself and thought about it, because anything I do here in the academy needs to reflect that oral tradition. Otherwise, I'm, it didn't happen, to be honest, because our old tradition is pretty comprehensive. I'm not necessarily talking about detail, you know, and there's room for, for learning new interactions, and, you know, and, and I always enjoy that, but um, our people know our history. We know where we've come from. Sometimes we forget it. Sometimes, of course, we forget the details, and that's, you know, the advantage of having access to the interweb and all that kind of stuff, and, and the library, and... Um, but the ideas, the principles, the so I am I am an historian, a professional historian. I teach history, um, but the real um, repositories of tribal knowledge are my elders who live back in our tribal homeland. Um, they, you know, might not be recognised by the Western Academy, but their knowledge is spectacular. They can go back multiple generations. They can make connections. They can see a baby and know where it comes from. They have this knowledge. They know these stories. My job is kind of to, partly to um, be that bridge to the Western world, um, to Pākehā here, but now, of course, to a global society, because I think we have something to contribute, something valuable. I think we have something to influence. And when I'm teaching white middle-class kids here um, at the university, um, and sometimes wondering why, to be honest, I remind myself because that's how we can advance as a people by influencing those levers in the society and around the world um, because it's all connected now, of course. Um, but also, um, you know, I can engage with other tribes and with our, the majority of our people who aren't living back in our tribal lands, who don't have our language, I can share with them as well um, in a different way that I might share from the, you know, white middle class kids. I'm saying that's like a bad thing. It's, you know, nothing wrong with being white middle class. <laughs> in here. It's just through that. So, um, yeah, but it's we. It's I'm only um, on the tiniest margins of our tribal knowledge um, with a particular role, um, which is that kind of um, um, bridge connection. I would say interpreter, but it doesn't need interpretation. You know, it stands on its own merits. Um, but yeah, we're also it's also vulnerable knowledge. So I do have um, even in here a, a lot of that traditional knowledge um, because I'm just in a the fortuitous position of being able to maintain it and mm -hmm. and retain it um, because we're losing. We're very poor communities. We have poor health. We die young, like I was saying. So um, it kind of falls to me in that way. But there are others who are much better at this than me. They just won't, you know don't need to engage in this way. So you're saying there are individuals 
who have all, a great deal of this historical knowledge, and it's all oral. Yeah, yep, yep. And they, they might think of it differently from the way I do with my very Western um, training, and they might express it differently, and they certainly um, might not write it down. Having said that, our, our um, um, tribal leader, who was an amazing um, repository of knowledge, he just died a couple of years ago. He could also, he had an honorary doctorate, he could... He just didn't get around to doing his PhD, but he was, you know, so, but that's our kind of tribal perspective. We, we our tribal perspective was to, uh, our tribal strategy was to engage with empire. So we're Anglican, we are teachers, lawyers, uh, soldiers. Um, some other tribes said, actually, we will do our own thing, thanks, um, and turned inwards. But we all had the same objective. That was to maintain our own um, knowledge, maintain our own integrity. Identity. We just had different ways of doing it. Unfortunately, we didn't treat some of the others very well as part of that. But that's another long story. Um, so we, we, you know, we're more we're comfortable in this environment um, as part of our plan. Um, whereas some other tribes just do things slightly differently. But yeah, yeah. So I'm just part of, um, you know, a much bigger um, body of knowledge. Um, it's not formal necessarily, but everyone in our tribe knows who to go to. Mm-hmm. Um, and I know my ranking. Hey, I could be uh, some kind of uh, distinguished professor and write lots of books, and I'll still be boy because, you know, that's my place. Um, and I'm, because it's we, um, as long as I do my job. Um, you know, yeah, I'll be comfortable. I'll be, I'm, I'm basically white, uh, middle class, you know. I, Hey, I get, I kind of get the cushy job. I get well paid, you know. It's like some of them are, you know, struggling to survive. To be honest, um, so I'm not exactly doing it hard, but I know um, they are certainly my my seniors in terms of our tribal knowledge so, and understandings, and I try and learn from them as much as I can. That's an awesome note to end on. I really appreciate the conversation. Thank you. Thanks. It's been great. All right, that was my conversation with Dr. Herini Ka. I hope you guys enjoyed it. I learned a lot. I'm sure you guys did. If you found this conversation valuable, you can help out the show by leaving a rating and a review on iTunes or Stitcher. Thanks, guys. I'll talk to you next week.